I am going to tell a story um, that's personal. That's the material I tend to work with as a poet. And um, as a poet, I'm also aware that I'm not inclined to very linear storytelling. And so I see this as a little bit of a challenge to myself to try and um, thread together a narrative. Um, I can't see you, as I think you know from this format. And so that's kind of interesting because uh, I don't think storytelling is generally like that. Or even when we tell a story in a conversation, we generally um, are able to sort of work with the listener's response. And um, here I'm not, and so that's different. But the way that it's familiar is it's a lot like writing a book. And so in that way, I feel like there's something familiar about um, making an attempt to convey material and not knowing as it goes out into the world what it's going to do. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, two cities, London and Kingston, Ontario. London is where my parents live and where I lived um, as a teenager and in my early 20s. And Kingston is where I lived and have for quite a while now. Um, the two cities have different weathers. They lie on either side of Toronto, um, each about two and a half hours, Kingston to the east of Toronto, London to the west. London has an interesting, um, sort of, it's part of a zone of, not just its own weather, but climate. It's a, it's a warmer part of Canada generally. And, um, it sits in a river valley. It's landlocked. It's not on any of the Great Lakes, but it has the Thames River flowing through it with several branches. And so it's kind of like a low, um, originally very um, woodsy kind of area. Um, and the, the warmth of the summers means, and, and the, the length of that, the length of that heat means that it has a, a kind of forest can grow there called Carolinian, which is um, a forest that tends to have very large deciduous trees, um, a low understory with lots of ferns in it often. And um, certain kinds of trees grow there that are rare on the side in Kingston. Um, among them are tulip trees, which are in the magnolia family. And then magnolias themselves um, get really big in London because of the uh, the local climate. I've seen magnolias there that are like three stories tall. Then I've seen one of those taken down for a backyard pool in the neighborhood, and it made me very sad. Um, over on the east side in Kingston, those trees do grow here, but they tend to stay much smaller if they do appear. And um, Kingston has a, um, I mean, its temperatures are kind of mitigated by the lake. And so to me, it doesn't feel as warm as London. I'm not actually sure if that's a real difference in absolute temperatures or if it just feels cooler because the lake has its own constant breeze coming over us. Um, I know it feels cold in the winter that way. There's this biting kind of cold to Kingston. And the the forest is different here. It's more of a maple, birch, pine kind of forest. Um, we're also much closer to the Canadian Shield, which influences what grows here. And one of my big weather memories of London, where the summers are really humid in the daytime, and then the day tends to close with a thunderstorm. And often we could kind of see it rolling in and uh, just this kind of wall of gray cloud, and then there'd be this relief of a downpour, um, sometimes really consistently every night. We don't have as many thunderstorms in Kingston. Um, sometimes there's a kind of snow in Kingston, though, called the lake effect snow, which forms when there's a certain kind of temperature difference between the water surface and the air, and then the lake water rises and falls down in snow. So I think what I'm trying to say is each city is got this really distinct feeling to it. And a lot of that has to do with the weather. Um, and there's no mistake in them. 
like as soon as I am over there in London, I can feel the difference. Um, I can also get a little head start on spring if I leave here, say, in April, and London tends to be about two weeks ahead in its springtime, so I can catch it there, come back and watch it arrive here as well. The two weathers, though, they are connected. That's because um, the prevailing winds between, or go across Ontario, really, but between the two cities are, um, I don't want to get this right. It's a west wind, yeah, because winds are named for where they come from, not for where they're going. So it's a west wind that moves from London to Kingston. And in my experience, so I know this because my mother has Dutch background, and um, even when there's nothing else to really talk about, Dutch people will always mention the weather. So my mother always says what the weather is in London. And when she does, I know that it's going to take about seven or eight hours for that weather to come over to where I am. It might change its shape a little bit, but it tends to be accurate. If it's raining there, that rain's going to come drift over across Toronto our way and it'll get here. And the same for clear skies, the same for snow. And I've thought about that because um, the drive between London and Kingston when I'm heading back, it's a little faster, it's five hours. And for some reason, whenever I'm driving that, I think about um, how interesting it would be if the speed limit, if it was coordinated with the movement of the weather and we were never allowed to drive faster than the weather moves. I think about what the highway would feel like under those conditions. Um, I think it would be safer, it would be slower, but it would be interesting to just kind of know that the way the sky is going, that we couldn't exceed it. And I haven't decided what could be the rule for the, um, the opposite direction, because actually once, once in a while there is an east wind, um, that blows, but it, I find it very noticeable when it does because it's it's unusual and um, often only lasts like half a day or so. But when it happens, I see it happen in the tree out in front of our house. I see the leaves blowing the opposite way, the wrong way. And it's an east wind, which um, in my father's culture, in Islamic culture, is a, is a fortuitous sign. It's a good wind. The east wind and so I always think well the little sign of something um something good is coming so last August I have been in London I had visited my family and um then I drove back to Kingston with my kid and um it took the usual time like I probably took a break um, here and there, so maybe it took six six hours or so. And when we got home, um, I opened the front door of our house, and there was a really strong smell of something like paint thinner, like a solvent. It smelled like. And um, we went in and we unpacked our things, and um, we went to sleep. And the next day, a friend came over to um, get to said he wanted to make us breakfast. And so he started cooking breakfast in the kitchen while I was kind of looking into what is the source of this smell in the house. Um, and he made tofu scramble with veggies in, in wraps. And then there was mango on the side. And we took that breakfast um, we decided we would eat it on the porch because the house was smelling pretty overwhelming. But in the meantime, I kind of looked around the basement. I looked around for any cans of old paint or solvent and put them outside and didn't seem to be helping that much. None of them were particularly smelly. And then I, I called someone who I thought might have some advice and they said, you should call the fire department because it could be the... Um, the coating, like the insulation on an electrical wire that's burning. And so there might be like a fire in your wall or something. 
So I called the fire department. I called the non-emergency number. I said what was going on and maybe they could send someone. Assuming that they would send like an inspector or something, someone in a car. But then as we were sitting on the porch eating at breakfast, um, a fire truck came down the street with full sirens and lights and it was for my house and they jumped out of the truck and they came in and they took a look around um and there was no fire they said they said it probably is a can of paint or something and so um spent the rest of that day trying to figure it out some more but it was getting to the point where i think we maybe spent one more night in the house and then realized like we can't really sleep here getting headaches it's irritating throats the smell just keeps getting stronger and so we started spending what would be i think it was two and a half weeks in the end of uh time at neighbors houses friends kind of couch surfing and in the meantime sorting out what was wrong and when i went back to the house day two or day three day three i went to the basement again it was clearly the source of the smell but still no real answer and then when i got down close to the floor really sniffed around i realized there are two holes in this concrete floor it's an unfinished basement and it's the two holes that are really the strongest um as far as the fumes go and they don't i don't know where they go they're just like little openings there's a lot of cracks in the concrete but these are the actual holes so um to make that part of the story short um i called some companies and a very good one came and looked into what was happening and it, it turned out there had been an oil spill at some point in the distant past under the house under the basement and um it was probably from an old oil like oil tank heat which no longer is no longer present there but um likely it was a residue from that kind of fuel and it was under the floor inside the limestone and um it got cleaned up fortunately it was something that they could dig out and around and, and remove but what happened during that time is um there were a lot of there's like a sequence of all men coming into the house for different reasons um working on that problem or on some like related things that came up or they were with insurance companies or appraisers there's all kinds of reasons for people to kind of come in and take a look and um each one would have a pretty strong like, opinion on what had happened and tell me about, you know, this is the read, this is what went on. And um, I don't remember the, all the range of, of theories, but that's to do with like cracks in the former oil tank or the way it was removed or where it was positioned, maybe in the alley outside the house, maybe in the basement itself. And nothing really was very satisfying as an answer until one day um, when, thank goodness, the, whole, the problem was solved. The oily debris was all gone. Um, the concrete had been re-poured. But a neighbor came in who was a, a contractor, a very experienced um, contractor in town. And um, he took a look at, at the work and he, he said, oh, you know what? happened and as soon as he explained it I, it just fell on I was like that is exactly what happened that's what happened he said um that week so the week that we were in London there was a huge drought like it was a very very dry time and he was right like I remember noticing on the drive home that um and I've seen this a few times now in Ontario not when I was younger but more recently the kind of drought where like actual big trees are, are drooping um and even the species that should be completely happy under all circumstances in the ontario ground like say milkweed or goldenrod they're suffering like you can see that they're drying out it was that kind of period of 
really, really dry weather. And so he said that when there's oil inside the sort of uh, slivers of opening that limestone naturally has, however it got there, somehow with the tank there, it got there, um, there's also always a, a film of water on top. So the oil is heavy in the water, but the water will be there. It's all through the limestone and it kind of seals it in. It seals it into place. And it probably had been like that for um, the estimate of when the oil tank was there is about 30 to 45 years ago. So it's been there a long time, but sealed away. And then that extreme dryness evaporated the water out and it could get out because of the basement floor not being very sealed up either. And, um, and then the oil could travel. Suddenly it was free after like decades of sitting there. Um, that's how it came up and came out through the floor. And um, I don't, I remember that there was this feeling of narrative satisfaction to that, to knowing that how, how it started. And um, it made me think of the phrase, the weather underground. And I mentioned that to Lisa when we chatted, thinking like, the weather was, was under there, it was under the house, it was underground. And then I thought, that's something, the weather underground is something else, maybe like something political, and I had to go look it up, but it was this um, this far left Marxist um, group in the States that ended up being labeled domestic terrorists. Um, they were against the Vietnam War, among other causes. Um, yeah, so while I was traveling with the wind from London to Kingston, there are different weathers. The dryness was allowing something in my basement to come back to life and kind of haunt us um, in the house. And then we cleaned it up. And the cleanup was very expensive and we couldn't live there for a little while. And um, that's my weather story. Thank you. <laughs>